ocean. Bring them in, bring them in, bring the wandering ones to Jesus. Out in the desert, hear their cry, out on the mountains wild and high. Hark, tis the master speaks to thee, go find my sheep where'er they be. Alright, uh, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for being with us. We thank you for helping us to grow in you. Lord, you have given us your word that we can, can uh, read and study what you desire out of our lives, how you want us to live. Lord, I pray that you would help us to have the desire to see others come to faith in Christ. Give us uh, the, the mind to reach out and uh, bring them in. Lord, not bringing them to the church, but bringing them to you uh, for you to make a difference in their lives. We ask for your direction now tonight as we look to your word. Give us wisdom and understanding as we hear again, uh, as you speak to us. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Five hundred thirty nine. Jesus is merciful, Jesus. 
Thank you, Jerry, and thank you, Owen. Going now to Acts chapter 13. We've been looking at the Apostle Paul. We're still looking at him and, and uh, how God worked in his life. Acts chapter 13, we're going to start at verse number 13. Remember last week we looked at uh, Paul on the island of Cyprus and where he met uh, the uh, sorcerer, um, Elymas, who was stricken blind because he was uh, uh, opposing the gospel, opposing the, the gospel being preached to, to the deputy of the island. And... Um, After he was struck, stricken blind, then uh, um, he, uh, the deputy, came to faith in Christ because he saw the working of God and heard the truth that Paul preached. So now we're 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 still on the island of Cyprus in verse number thirteen, and uh, uh, they travel. <coughs> Verse number 13, Now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia, and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue said unto them, sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. Wow, what a dangerous thing to do. I, you know, I didn't really think of it, but when if somebody came into the church and come to visit, and here's Paul and, and, and Barnabas coming from who knows where. And they probably told him they're from Jerusalem or Antioch. And here they are in a synagogue. And what type of people are usually in synagogues? Jews, okay. Now, there may have been some Gentiles, some proselytes there in the synagogue, but mainly Jews. But if uh, here comes, if somebody came into church here to visit, I would not give them the opportunity to speak to the people unless I knew them. And I, unless I knew their, their reputation, their testimony, I knew that they believed the way we believe. So then they would preach or teach or talk. But here they just give them the opportunity. It seems like it's just a, a, a normal thing in a synagogue that a Jew had the opportunity to say some words. Remember what Jesus did in Luke chapter 4? He got up and he read the scripture and talked to them a little bit. And what did they do? They wanted to throw him off a cliff. <laughs> they wanted to take him out and throw him off a cliff. Because he was saying he was the Messiah. Uh, now, Paul's not going to do that, but Paul has the opportunity uh, to preach there. Now, notice where they are, just so you know, and I, there uh, may be some, if you're not familiar with the, uh, the accounts of Paul and the, and the travels, it says they're in Antioch here, but this is a different Antioch from the town that they were sent from. They were sent. I'll turn around and use my map up here, okay? Now we've got the Mediterranean Sea here. Over here is Jerusalem in, in Israel, and up here is Antioch in Syria, okay? They left Antioch in Syria and came to the Mediterranean Sea and went to the island of, of um, Cyprus, and then they, then they moved up to uh, Perga in Pamphylia, and then there's another Antioch up here in Pisidia. Okay, so that's where they are in Antioch and Pisidia, not Antioch and Syria. So they are there, uh, and they have the opportunity to preach. And, and I don't, I don't know if if Pharisees wore something special or not. I don't know if they knew that Paul was a Pharisee. Uh, he, they knew he was a Jew. He came into the synagogue. And uh, they said, if you have something to say, speak.
Paul then uses the opportunity as he speaks. He, he does speak a lot. And um, he preaches the gospel. He tells them what they need to know. When we have an opportunity, there are many times we have opportunities, but we keep our mouths quiet. And we need to learn to see the opportunities, to take those opportunities. I want to read um, a little account. As, um, I'm pretty sure it was Adoniram Judson, um, a missionary back in the 1800s or 1700s, who came back from the mission field and had the opportunity to speak to the people of his country, England, and he spoke. And what he, what he did was he preached the gospel to them. And somebody said to him afterwards, the people are very much disappointed. He says, why? What did they want? I presented to the best of my ability the most interesting subject in the world. But they wanted something different, a story. Well, I am sure I gave them a story, the most thrilling one that can be conceived of. <laughs> so the same, same person says to him, but they, they had heard it before. They wanted something new from a, something like uh, from a, uh, a remote part of the world and tell what happened to you. Well, he says this, then I am glad they have it to say that a man coming from a remote part of the world, had nothing better to tell than the wondrous story of the dying love of Jesus. My business is to preach the gospel. And when I can speak at all, I dare not trifle with my commission. When I looked upon those people today and remembering where I should next meet them, how could I stand up and furnish food to vain curiosity, tickle their fancy with amusing stories, however decently strung together on a thread of religion. That is not what Christ meant by preaching the gospel. And then, how could I hereafter meet the fearful charge, quote, I gave you one opportunity to tell them of me. You spent it in describing your own adventures, end quote. He said, I have an opportunity. And he didn't know if those people he was speaking to, he didn't know if they were saved or not. But he took the opportunity to preach the gospel, not stand there and tell a bunch of stories. And I, I, <laughs> I remember having a, a visiting preacher, probably a, a per person who was on, uh, on the way to the mission field. And they got up here and, and uh, stood up to preach. And, and he's from a, a, what I thought was a good college. And uh, he read a, a passage of scripture, and he could have closed his Bible because he never went back to it. And uh, he just told stories from then on, and, and I, I was just amazed. Uh, boy, I'm not going to do that again. I, I really filter out people <laughs> if they're going to, they're going to stand here. I, I mean, I don't always get to um, hear the preacher or talk to him beforehand. So sometimes they'll. They'll slip by, but uh, now we want people to preach the Word of God. We want people to tell us what God says. Now, we can read what God says, but sometimes we need... You know, even, the, even in the Scripture, it tells, tells us that the prophets and uh, the leaders read the Scripture to the people. And then it says that they gave the sense of it. They needed to hear in their own words what God was telling them. And so sometimes we need extra people, extra help in determining what God wants us to know. And so we do write, read the scripture, but we need somebody to help sometimes. Paul stood there and he preached the gospel. Look at uh, verse number 16. I think I stopped at verse 15. So Paul stood up here, it says. Then Paul stood up and beckoning with his hand said, Men of Israel and ye that fear God, give audience. 
this is what I think we, we need to remember. People need to hear the gospel. People need to, uh, they have to hear it before they'll listen to it. You know what I'm saying? They can hear it, but it's going to skip and pass their understanding if they're not paying attention and desiring to know what the gospel is. He says, men of Israel, and, and he's, he's talking to one group of people, and even he might be speaking to, in a sense, two groups, men of Israel and those that fear God. Okay, there are people who are saved, or, or I shouldn't say saved, I'm, people who are Israelites, but they don't fear God. So he says, ye men of Israel, number one, you are God's people, Number two, some of you fear God. And he says both groups here, or the whole group, maybe most of you do fear God, but I'm telling you, he says give audience. Now that word audience, if you uh, think of words, I, I do a lot. Audio, meaning the sound, the audio system in the church here is the sound system audience you know it's somebody who is listening when there when there's a uh, if somebody's if if we're showing a movie up here on the screen we watched a movie and everybody's here uh, <laughs> you would be the audience right watching it but you're watching it and listening to it if you're just watching it and you don't hear anything you'd be the vidians but we wouldn't be nobody calls it that would you Audience. The word is is where we get the word. The Greek word gives us the word acoustics, and that also has to do with sound. So Paul is saying, all of you people, listen. To give audience means to listen, to pay attention to what I'm going to say. It's an important thing that he's going to speak. So he says, I want you to listen carefully, because. It is what God wants you to know. It is the truth, the absolute truth of the gospel. And so both groups, there are people who we talk with about the gospel. And sometimes they, they actually look in their countenance. They look like they're really interested, <laughs> but they're... But sometimes they're not. But they want to be nice. They want to seem nice, and they'll listen to you. And um, then they then they walk away from you when you're done, and they forget all about it because they really didn't care. And so they need to learn to fear God. They need to understand that God expects out of all people obedience. Does God expect obedience out of unsaved people? Yes. He wants them to be saved. That's obedience. He wants them to obey. And then they can walk with Him. But uh, He wants, I mean, that's why Jesus came. For everyone uh, to be able to be saved. People in all, I believe in all religions, and I, I won't say just all, uh, I quote-unquote Christian religions, uh, those who talk about the God of the, the Bible. Uh, but there are other religions. I believe there are people who come to their religious services out of habit more than out of desire to know the truth. I think if they really wanted to know the truth, God would show it to them and they wouldn't be in cer certain <laughs> churches or religions. They would be leaving. But there are most of the people are go because it's their heritage, their culture. They grow up in one religion and they don't they don't know anything else. And they said this is this is the way my parents were and this is the way I am. Instead of seeking what God wants and what God expects. Paul says give audience then he goes on well let, let me let me show you what um, what some people the people that, that that who are who will listen 
because they know they want the truth. Go back to Acts chapter 10. This has not not Paul didn't have anything to do with this account here. But I want you to see this this one man And I, I believe there were many people like him. But this is the, the one that, that God singles out. Chapter 10, verse number 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. Sounds like a real, uh, sounds like a, <laughs> sounds like the way a Christian should be, right? But there was a problem. He feared God, but he was what we would call an Old Testament saint. Uh, he was, he was an, um, a Gentile. He was not a Jewish person, but he had, had gone away from his uh, the the religion of his youth. He was an he, he's from the Italian band. He's probably Roman, and he the Romans believed in many gods. And so here is this man, this centurion, who is fearing God. He worshipped one God. He prayed to God always. He feared God. And Paul said, "Ye that fear God, pay attention. Well, if, if Cornelius was there in that group, and he wasn't, if he was in that group, he would be paying attention because he needed more than what he knew. He knew that there was one God. He threw away all of the false gods, Apollo and Mercury and all of those people, people all of those myths, and he turned to the one true God like the Jewish people did. But he didn't know that Jesus was the Messiah, like the Jewish people. Did not recognize Jesus as the Messiah, and they kept refusing that, many of them. Paul needed to tell them what they, what they needed to know. And so Paul teaches these people the gospel of Jesus Christ. But he doesn't start out saying, <laughs> If you died today, do you know you'd go to heaven? What does Paul do? He gives them their own history. He begins speaking to them about themselves and their history beginning at Egypt. Look at verse 17. The God of the, this people of Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. And with an high arm brought he them out of it. And about the time of forty years suffered he their manners in the wilderness. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he divided their land to them by lot. And after that he gave unto them judges about the space of four hundred years, on fifty years, until Samuel the prophet. And afterward they desired a king. And God gave them, unto them Saul the son of Sis, a man of the tribe of Benjamin by the space of forty years. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Of this man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. So he brought them from Egypt to Jesus. What these people in Antioch of Pisidia may not have heard about Jesus. Maybe the news had got to them that there was this man who was claiming to be the Messiah. We don't know what they knew. But Paul says Jesus is the Savior. Comparing that with what they knew about the Old Testament, what they knew about Israel, and when they came into uh, the land of Canaan, Joshua was their savior. He led the people into uh, Canaan. Jesus is the name Joshua in, uh, in 
Greek. And so they may have just pictured a person named Joshua or, or Jesus. But Paul goes on and gives him more about John the Baptist and teaching them about what Jesus did and who he was. There are people today who have heard the name Jesus, heard the, the words. They may even have seen, well, you see crucifixes. What's a crucifix? It's not just a cross. It's Jesus still on the cross. And so people see that. They understand that this person, Jesus, died on a cross 2,000 years ago. They might even say that he died on the cross for sins, for the sins of mankind. But it makes no difference if they haven't listened to it with the heart and understood it, knowing that God did it for them. God did it because God loved them. So Paul says also in verse 26, he says, Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, who are they? The stock of Abraham? Israelites. Israelites. Okay, he's talking to the Jewish people. Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. He says, God is giving you the truth to the Jewish people, the stock of Abraham, the ones who think that because they're children of Abraham, everything's okay. But then it's also those who fear God. Maybe some, and we, we see this later as, as you look in the, toward the end of the chapter, uh, that their Gentiles probably did hear him speak because they wanted him to hear him again. But uh, they might have been these proselytes. A proselyte is a, uh, a person who is not Jewish who converts to a Jewish, to Jewish religion. And some are, are proselytes who go all the way into the Jewish religion. And some are called proselytes of the gate. They, don't, they, just, they stand back, but they worship God. And that's what they believe uh, Cornelius was, called proselyte of the gate. He could only go so far into the worship at the temple, but no further because of uh, certain regulations. But here he says, you, Jewish people, and everyone who fears God. And, he, and he's, he's not saying, look what he says in that, that second part of there, the, that sentence. He says, um, whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. He's not, he's not saying, those of you who fear God, you're saved. He's saying, I'm giving you the truth that you need. To you who fear God and you who are God's people, God is giving you the truth and you need to pay attention to it and listen to it. We as Christians, we have the truth. We have what the world needs. What the world needs now is not love. It needs Christ. It needs Jesus Christ. And it needs to have a desire to know Him. A desire to be <laughs> rescued from eternal punishment. But if they don't hear anything, they're not going to listen. Romans. Is it Romans 10? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So we need to give them the Word of God. What we know, what we know the Bible teaches, we preach it, we teach it. And we might come upon people who don't care. We might come upon people who do care, who want to know the truth, who are searching for the truth. Wouldn't it be great to find those people? But you know, it is great to be able to water the garden. It's great to be able to plant the seed. I won't talk about our garden. <laughs> Some gardens don't get, I mean, you can plant the seed, but it's, it, even if you water it, the seed doesn't grow. The seed doesn't sprout. 
we have a responsibility to present the gospel a responsibility to, to preach what God wants us to preach and that is the good news of Jesus Christ let me look at what happens in this account um, <clears throat> go down to verse number um, 44 okay they leave they leave from that that Sabbath day and and they they leave but then it says, And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. Wow! I would love to see that. Wouldn't that be... Can you imagine the whole city almost... Well, let's just say half the city of Los Banos coming here to hear the word of God. Maybe out there in that field, but not right here. But almost the whole city came to hear what Paul had to say. Because the people who heard him the first time said, There's something different here. They must have spread the word. These people who may not, not have even believed say, man, this guy is teaching something that is really cool. And people came. So anyway, almost the whole city to hear the word of God. Then there's this word, but, okay, but when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy. What are the multitudes? Not Jewish people, okay? They are racist, in a sense. They were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Wow. And they were God's chosen people. Now they're against the truth. They don't know it, but this envy is overtaking their thoughts and their emotions. And they're speaking these bad things about Paul. Look what they do. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. He's talking to the Jews. But seeing you put it, ye put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. Lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Oh, man, I, I, I really wouldn't have wanted to be part of that group. But they probably thought, great, go talk to somebody else. Don't bother us with this gospel. And there are people in the world who will do that right today. Good, leave me alone and go talk to somebody else. Okay, that's up to you. You judge yourself unworthy. Not, uh, you know, I'm giving you the truth. And if you don't want to accept the truth, I'm sorry. But they go to the Gentiles. He says, For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad, and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city, and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and expelled them out of their coast. Wow. Get rid of, just go on, get away from here. But they shook off the dust of their feet against them, and came unto Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. Wow. Filled with joy after they'd been treated like that? After Paul and Barnabas were kicked out of this town? And, and the disciples are filled with joy. Why? Because Jesus said that we should count it all joy when you suffer for his sake. And, uh, and here they were, suffering. Remember, though, they did, and in, in this case, they, they planted the seed. We don't know how much watering, how many people had heard the truth about Jesus in the, in the first place, but at least they planted the seed. We've got to remember that we can't be, uh, uh, we can be disappointed to an extent, but we can't be down if nobody ever pays attention to us. You can't let people make you feel like you're not doing your job. How many people are any of us going to send to hell? zero 
people, if they reject the gospel, they're on their way already. And so don't let people... God does the saving. Paul says some people plant, some people water, but God gives the increase. It's not you, it's not me, it's not the church, it's not an evangelist, it is God who saves people. We present the gospel. We preach the truth. Paul preached and God gave the increase. He, he, people rejoiced, people were saved, but overall those people didn't want him in their town and they kicked him out. If that ever comes to that, all right, we just we did our job. That's what God wants us to do. Preach the gospel to every creature and let God do the work in their hearts. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ. And we thank you for the example of missionaries who have gone forth and preached the gospel and taught the gospel. Lord, it's the truth that we are to present to people. And we don't know how they're going to receive it, how they're going to either accept it or reject it. Sometimes it falls on deaf ears and uh, they look like they're interested, but they don't want to have anything to do with us. But Lord, help us to stand up for you and preach the gospel and teach the gospel. Be evangelists the way you want us to be. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.